Uh, thanks for joining us for the June Housing Action Coalition meeting. Uh, today's topic is how do we dismantle the racist legacy of homeownership policies? And we have three fantastic speakers with us here today to, and to go over those topics. I'll introduce them in a minute, but first a few logistical notes. So when you're not talking, make sure your microphones are on mute. We've uh, muted everyone for the start here. Um, then I want to also direct your attention to the gallery view versus the speaker view. Uh, you can switch between them using the button at the top right corner of your screen. It's going to look a little different when the screen share is happening than when um, we're just in open uh, gallery mode, but it will be at the top right hand of the screen that you can change um, whether you're seeing who's speaking or whether you're seeing the full list of people who are in the meeting. Uh, and since we had so much interest in attending, way beyond the 100 person limit on our Zoom plan, uh, we'll be recording the meeting to post afterwards. So we'll have that available uh, either on YouTube or through another means. Uh, and we do want to know, we always like to do it with these hacks, uh, who's on the call. So please introduce yourselves in the chat. You can just do your name, your organization, and if you like, what you're hoping to get from today. Okay, while you guys are doing that, I'm going to introduce the hack in general. So hack is HAC, the Housing Action Coalition. It actually predates SV at Home. It's a long running thing in Santa Clara County. It's a forum for a discussion of important housing issues affecting Santa Clara County. And we had to adjust to a virtual format, obviously, uh, but it will be every Friday of the month. Next month, we'll be talking about the commercial linkage fee that's proposed for San Jose, which would raise money for affordable housing by taking into account the jobs impact of new commercial development. So that'll be a very, uh, very action-oriented meeting next, next month. Okay, let's go ahead and introduce our speakers. So I'm gonna do this in reverse order. So you'll, the person I met introduced first will be the last person you hear from in the presentation. So we have here, John Gamboa, who is the vice chair of the 200, which is a statewide coalition of community leaders, opinion makers, and minority advocates that's working to mitigate the growing racial wealth gap through home ownership and home building in California. John was formerly the executive director of the Green Lining Institute. And before that, he was executive director of the Latino Issues Forum. He has been active in combating redlining and providing a voice for the poor and underserved in insurance, philanthropy, banking, housing, energy, higher education, and telecommunications issues. We also have with us Kevin Coleman. Kevin Coleman is with um, Kingdom Development Group, LLC. He began his investment career with Intel Capital in 2008. And in 2014, Kevin left Intel Capital to launch Kingdom Development Group, LLC, which is a company formed with a holistic approach to investing. Their mission is simple, keeping wealth in the community by building real estate assets and providing a positive return on community. Ownership is power and wealth creation is a revolutionary act, which makes Kevin and his partners wealth and economic activists. And then last but not least, we have Dejan Grace, who is the economic, or Dejan Grace, who is the Economic Equity Fellow at the Green Lining Institute, a policy, research, organizing, and leadership institute that's working for racial and economic justice. At Greenlining, Dejan works with financial institutions to provide communities of color with access to capital, avenues to homeownership, and to promote both leadership and supplier diversity. He has dedicated his life to searching for a solution to the shared economic and spiritual struggle of black and brown communities, a solution that will allow for a collective shift of focus away from basic survival towards a household that thrives. And I'm Mitch Mankin from SV Home. I'll be your host today. Uh, but for now, I'll be stepping out of the way to allow Dejan to begin the presentation. Uh, Dejan? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to be here and a pleasure of mine. I have the uh, distinct pleasure of presenting with you all alongside Kevin Coleman. A uh, quick introduction again. My name is Dejan Grace. Um, as Mitch, I'm the Economic Equity Fellow at Greenlining Institute, where collectively we work to reduce the racial wealth gap. And uh, we envision a world where race is no longer a barrier to economic prosperity. I'm going to pass it to Kevin quickly and introduce himself. Kevin Coleman, managing partner, once again, uh, we are wealth and economic activists. Um, we believe that our social change is the growth of wealth within the African American community and marginalized community at large. Okay, Mitch, next slide, please, Mitch. For the agenda, we're going to make sure that we answer these three questions, essentially. How did we get here? Uh, the role in which systemic racism set the precedent for the disparities we see today. Um, how the systemic racism persists in home ownership today and what can we do about it? Next slide, please. 
Perfect. Thank you. So first, we're going to uh, provide a little context for everybody, starting with the 246 years of slavery. Um, now, I am trusting that everyone here is at least somewhat familiar with slavery, so I won't spend too much time here. Let me just close this. I won't spend too much time here. However, for this conversation, we will focus on the year 1865. Um, this is the year slavery was abolished with the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, subsequently, he gave a direct order for former slaves to receive interest in soil. Um, he promised each 40 acres land that was previously financed uh, for plantation owners. Now, thus, is birthed the phrase 40 acres and a mule um, that I'm sure some of you have heard. Uh, this resulted in General William T. Sherman signing the field order. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Signing the field order 15 of March 1865. Now, you see that mark there uh, because prior to one full harvest season actually passing, Andrew Johnson, the picture of the man to the left, uh, and Abraham's successor uh, confiscated the land that was distributed as a result of this field order. Why was this important? Because this is the first time in American history that Black people had a chance to own anything, anything. And with this opportunity, the Black community was so prosperous that they were reported to have made a century's worth of progress in just one year. In just one year. So let me, let me just really emphasize that in one year, a deficit of 100 years was erased. Now, not only did this confiscation of our land cease all substantive growth within the Black community, but it also set the tone of the relationship between the Black community and the systemic denial of wealth building. We were promised land, we were promised restitution, and now we're stripped of us. So this was the start of what transpired over the course of history. The first act of systemic denial to the American dream and economic warfare to the Black community. Next slide, please. Next, we'll take a look at the uh, next 103 years. <laughs> but we're only going to highlight two significant initiatives. Um, first is the Homestead Act. From 1868 to 1934, uh, the federal government gave away 270 million acres in 160 acre tra tracks, excuse me, which was nearly 10% of all the land in the nation. And this land was given to more than 1.5 million white families, native born and foreign. Now, according to one historian, some 46 million American adults today, which is nearly 20% of all American adults, are descendants of those homesteaders. This is important because subsequently, uh, we have the FDR's New Deal, which is where the red line of picture comes in. We're talking about the, the New Deal because segregation in the administration's housing programs followed a pattern that was established by the New Deal's construction, employment, and job agencies. For example, in 1933, the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, was created to bring jobs and economic growth uh, to a particularly struggling region. It developed a model village with 500 comfortable homes that were leased to employees and construction workers. However, th it was only available to the white workers because African Americans did not fit the program. Instead, African Americans were forced to stay in barracks uh, some distance away. Now this model of denial uh, happened not, not just in Tennessee, but also close to home in cities like Richmond, Modesto, East Palo Alto. Housing available by the hundreds were denied to African Americans for reasons outside of policy and even logic. Now immediately following this, uh, 1934 FDR created the Federal Housing Administration which insured bank mortgages that covered 80% of purchase prices. They also had terms of 20 years and were fully amortized because no one could afford buying homes outside of the affluent communities. Essentially, FDR committed to building the white middle class. And to determine eligibility for this insurance, the FHA conducted their own appraisal of property uh, to ensure low risk of defaulting. Now, unfortunately, this meant if you were black, you were outlined, right? You, you weren't, you were uh, artificially excluded because the FHA's appraisal standards included a whiteness only requirement. Therefore, racial segregation became an official requirement of the federal mortgage insurance programs. Developers were only approved for financing upon a condition that they denied housing specifically to black people. And to accommodate this request, right? To accommodate this request, red line maps were created. The example is here to the right. Neighborhoods were basically color-coded based on their degree of blackness and racial composition. The more black families in a given neighborhood, the closer to red your neighborhood received on this color map. 
Now, if you received a red, trust me, you didn't want to have that. It was an F. It was like an F in any class, right? The association of this red, of the redness of your neighborhood, meant that you were determined high risk, right? Which meant that essentially, because you were a high risk, you uh, were associated or automatically given ridiculously high interest rates, horrific terms, a denial of equity, and disinvestment in your neighborhoods. So from the years of 1934, right, the creation of FHA through 1962, the FHA financed more than $120 billion in new housing, and 98% of that went to white Americans, while less than 2% went to African Americans and communities of color. The matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, is that throughout the mid 20th century, government housing projects frequently defined the racial character of neighborhoods that endured for many years afterwards, including areas within the East Bay and South Bay. Next slide, please. Now for this, uh, for this next point, I'm gonna transition to Kevin. So let's set the stage. We're in 1968. You have a generation, which for me was my grandparents' generation. They have endured uh, unimaginable challenges. And in the year of 1968, there was a great civil unrest that had taken over the whole nation, kind of similar to what we're experiencing right now. And that civil unrest was not just in the East Coast or the West Coast, but it was the whole nation. In every major city, there was an uprising. And out of that, there was a National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorder that was created, better known as the Kerner Commission. So the Kerner Commission's whole role was to examine and try to understand why was this nation going through so much civil unrest in, in the African American communities. And the report called out, uh, which was sent at the time to President Johnson, the report called out that what the culprit was, was white racism, which was leading to pervasive discrimination in employment, education, and housing. So once again, I set the stage again. We just experienced 246 years, another 103 years, and now there's civil unrest in a generation that is saying enough is enough. We have endured, we have believed, we have fought wars on behalf of this nation, we have sold blood, sweat, and tears and unrest is taking over the nation, very similar to what we're experiencing right now. And what came up out of the Kerner's Commission were two important, uh, with the long of other uh, important acts that were passed, which was the 1968 Fair Housing Act and the Civil Rights Act. Those two acts were in direct response to the Kerner's Commission looking at and trying to understand why was there so much civil unrest in this nation? But let's set the context. Because I think when these policies were created, we have a belief that policy can legislate the heart. And though these policies were created in 1968, they were not able to address the heart matter. But before we can even address this policy being created, let's play a game. And let's put this all into context. I think for all of us on the phone call, uh, or on the Zoom call, have at one point in time in our life, has sat down to play the game with them monopoly. Um, I think we can all say that monopoly is a way in which we understand how wealth is created um, and how wealth uh, is grown over time. But one thing that we all know about the game monopoly is that it does two things very well. The game monopoly does not take into any account any past or present discrimination. Instead, when we play the game of monopoly, every player begins the game with an equal amount of money and are treated identical by banks, businesses, and the court of law. So in theory, the game of monopoly was what life was supposed to be post passage of the Housing and Civil Rights Act. Now pause right there. When these policies were created, essentially it was creating a utopian society where race and uh, the attributes of race would no longer be factor in in how banks lended and how homes were bought and sold and how we as Americans were able to move from community to within community from not just how we live, but how we're educated, how we're employed, and how we're compensate, compensated for the same amount of, of, of work. It was the ideal utopian society, but I wanna play a different kind of game. I wanna play Monopoly based on the historical facts of our nation. So let's say, for instance, we start the game Monopoly. 
So before the game begins, all players are lined up. We have every player lined up ready to play the game. However, one player is able to go around the board 246 times accumulating property, adding apartments, adding hotels, collecting income. Because we forget, you go around, go, you collect 200, that 200 is then reinvested into buying apartments, homes, and eventually hotels. What is the game about? It is about building wealth. So for 246 years, this wealth was accumulated at an astronomical rate. I mean, we've all played Monopoly. Can you imagine someone going 246 around the board and then you all of a sudden getting ready to play? Here's what we also have to remember during this time and period of our nation's history. Andrew Carnegie, one of the great industrials, said 90% of millionaires are created through real estate. So think about it. If the formation, the building of our country, post, post the building of our, our country and our economy through, through child slavery, that real estate was the path to build, the build, to continue to build wealth, and one player had the ability to go around 246 times, it's not the same game just because policy has been created that another player is able to actually play the game in the same way. But let's, let's also remember what Dijon laid out. After 246 years, another player is now able to join the board. However, for 103 years, that player can only buy in one section. So if you guys remember the game of Monopoly, as soon as you pass board, there was what we would call the low income area. It was the impoverished area. It was a place in which property was cheap. And the reality of it is that the wealth grew very minimum compared to other parts around the board. So you can imagine for 103 years, you were able to only buy in one section of the board. But it's not just buying only in one section of the board, because that would have kind of been great. Because at that point, you can build up hotels, you can create your own kind of you know, culture or community. But not only were you only able to buy in one section, you had very limited access to bank financing. And more importantly, when you pass go, there wasn't the same equal pay given out. So for another 103 years playing the game of Monopoly, wealth was created, wealth was grown. But if we want to be honest with ourselves and we play the game of Monopoly and we use the history, the history of America, the context of our wealth creation is not accurately seen through the correct lens. We were able to grow wealth despite opposition that we considered to be inhumane or unfathomable, particularly for our generation and all the access that we now have. Well, that was my grandmother's generation. And by the time my parents graduated high school, the great utopia and the great, the great ideals that this nation had always spoken from the formation, that generation fought to hold our nation accountable. And what they got to experience was the passing of the Housing Act and the Civil Rights Act. That's my parent generation. But what we don't talk about is that wealth that was created from the grandparent generation, how that wealth is passed to our parent generation and eventually to our generation. Inheritance is a key wealth creator for this nation. And just because policy is passed, Policy does not legislate the heart. So we have to be very mindful that the discriminatory practices that we experienced in the 20th century um, created a situation where wealth was taken from these communities before it even had the opportunity to grow. And this is where we want to pause and stop at. Because I think there's this idealism that we had, and particularly for our parents' generation in 1968, that with the passing of these legislation, that overnight this nation had changed. And the reality of it is, is that Though policy had changed, there were still discriminatory practices that had existed. Because just because laws are created, there are humans behind these laws. There are humans that are either implementing, standing on them, or disregarding them. And so I want to transition to our next point, which is how did we get to where we are today? And if I just take my lifetime, we went through the Great Recession. The Great Recession, what we saw particularly in the African-American community, we saw, uh, we saw the wealth decline in our community at an astronomical rate. Because why? When the reports came out, what was discovered was that predatory lending had run rampant in the African-American community. You had the generation who endured everything that Dijon laid out, which is my grandparent generation. They fought, they crawled, they scratched. When they had no ability to go to get bank financing, they lend amongst each other. Home ownership was at the highest rate for that generation. 
There was a time in San Francisco where the highest rate of home ownership was in the Bayview Hunters Point District because that generation understood the power of ownership. That generation understood that even if they were denied access to, to bank financing or even government financing, which is FHA loans, they figured out a system to loan money to each other in order to buy property because they knew if they can own their property, they were able to control their destiny of not only their family, but their community. But now they've gotten older. They, they're now in their 80s and, and late, late, latter part of their years. And they're being approached by predatory lenders who understand that they don't really have a lot of access to income. So they, the, the greatest income they have is access to their equity. These loans were so predatory that we saw a decimation in the African American community post Great Recession. That is where we stand today. Let alone, we could talk through the epidemic, uh, the biological warfare, the war on drugs, and all those impacts that were had or experienced in the African American community. So when we talk about the game of monopoly, we have to, be, we have to, look, through, we have to look through a, a, a realistic lens. Like the lens we have to look through is that we didn't get here in a silo, and we didn't get here based on some history that was 500 years ago. That history was passed down generation through generation, and laws were enacted that supported state-sanctioned economic warfare in the African-American community, and more importantly, in marginalized and people of color communities. These were experiences not just for our community, but as well as brown community, as well as uh, our Asian community, as well as there were laws enacted that even women had a challenge uh, in terms of being able to get financing to buy property. They had to have a husband to go in with them. So these experiences were wholesale experienced by a lot of people in our community. Now, how do we address this? Because I think what's most important is we have a very understanding, clear understanding of how we got here. But more importantly is how do we get to a solution space? Well, before we can talk about solution, let's just talk about where we're at right now as a nation. When COVID-19 hit our nation as a pandemic, if we take a step back and watch the response from the top of our government all the way down to our local civic leaders, as well as our county leaders. We saw wholesale policy changes. We saw for, <laughs> I think for our community, community that historically we've been told there is no money, there is no money to address these historical injustices. We saw overnight trillions created that supported small businesses, that supported small owners, that, that supported home ownership. We saw state laws be in place that protected renters that protected owners. We saw the government shore up, uh, shore up small businesses in lending. So for us, the solution is not anything that is foreign to us. We know how to solve pandemic and epidemics. We know how to solve economic warfare as well. We have seen it historically in the rebuilding of our communities. We have seen it not just locally, but we've seen it nationally. We have seen the restoration of many devastated communities. So I think we have to first start with some reality. It's not a lack of opportunity in restoring our community. It's purely a lack of will. The will is not there. And until the will is there, we will always be stumped. We will always be regarding solutions. But in terms of practical solution, there are two things that we can do that will quickly address home ownership in the African-American community and more at large, the marginalized communities. The first is this. We have to look at access to capital. If we experienced in the 1950s and 60s, quality capital, traditional banks leave up out of uh, you know, marginalized communities, African-American communities wholesale, and what was replaced was predatory lending. These are your payday, your check cashings. The reality of it is, if you look at communities of color and you ask where their local banks are, most of the time, they're having to leave out their community and drive to another community in order to get quality capital. So if that capital that banks are lending comes from essentially is supported by our government, and the reality is we pay into the same system, then we have the ability to shore up and create banks in marginalized communities that address the systemic issues that have been felt for generations, number one. Number two, we have to look at how does one get access to capital? It's through credit. Well, if we know that there has been uh, a wholesale economic warfare amongst marginalized communities, 
Then we have to do the reverse, which is restore those communities. And how we first do it is through education. We have to first look at how we actually factor in credit. And if most of the communities, marginalized communities are renters, we need to factor in that payment to rent as part of their credit, because that is showing a track record of making consistent payments. Now we know that those payments are going to an owner who is building wealth. And what we're seeing right now, unfortunately, from a state level, we're seeing, once again, there is all of these policies being created to protect the renter. But my question is, if, we, if we're intentional about turning those renters into owners, right, and stopping the legacy of economic warfare, right, if we stop the legacy of economic warfare by not looking at our community as renters, but seeing our community as owners, that would be a we can implement solution to address the problem. Now, we have a whole host of ways in which our company is addressing uh, the restoration of our community, particularly it's about owning assets. By owning assets, you're able to own and create the outcomes for our own communities. And I think the challenge becomes first is valuing our communities and seeing values in it. I don't think we have a housing crisis. We have a crisis in identity and how we see our community and how we see our nation, particularly the most marginalized in our community. And when we start with that, crisis first, I think we will have the will and we will find the will to start to solve these problems. Yes, that is spot on, Kevin. Um, that was absolutely beautiful and powerful. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the other content. Uh, I would rather say that for Q&A, and I also want to make space for Mr. Gambora. Um, I think what Kevin presented in the solutions is spot on. Um, that essentially covers everything that we wanted to say. Um, there are some green line and specific solutions that we like to employ, such as a racial equity lens um, that we apply in our analysis um, and uh, something we call racial equity framework, which I would love to go over later. Um, but in our economic priorities, you see there. But uh, again, in the interest of time, I want to thank everyone for uh, allowing us to have this space. Uh, Kevin, again, that was absolutely powerful, man. I enjoyed it. I love that. Um, yeah, we want to wrap it up. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. So, yeah, we're just going to put our content information right there. Um, we're going to pass it back to Mitch um, and, yeah, to conclude our presentation. Yeah. And next we're going to be hearing from John Gumbo from the Green Lining Institute, or a foreman of the Green Lining Institute, now at the 200, I bet. John, can you... Uh, Unmute yourself. There we go. You are unmuted. Oh, I can't do it. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Everybody gonna be sorry that you unmuted me. But anyway, thank you. Anyway, anyway, Mitch, thank uh, thank you and the SCB for putting this this event on. I don't think there's a more important issue today than the issue of poverty in the nation. And I think the poverty in the nation has been a result of the lack of home ownership and redlining for all these years. And that has created a 16 times lower wealth for communities of color than for whites on it. I think a lot of what's happening out in the streets is the results of that redlining. Anyway, give you a little bit of background on CCB. The, the organization I belong to. It was start, the housing uh, portion, the 200 was started by a group of, we call ourselves veteran community activists, but really known as old. Um, started by Cruz Reynoso, who, uh, who former Supreme Court Justice, and Herman Gallegos, uh, founder of National Council of La Raza, and on many, many boards, bank boards and community boards. George Dean, the founder of California Urban Leagues, and Bruce Kwan, an activist in the Asian community, and many others on it. We got together to address the issue of wealth on it. We were so dismayed to see that all of the work we had been doing in the years kind of did not produce much on it. The wealth gap was growing rather than, than decreasing on it. And we came to the conclusion that that uh, gap was because of the lack of home ownership. 
home ownership created the great white middle class in this country. In fact, it was the uh, uh, countries across the world looked at the United States and says, wow, what a great country and wealthy country. And it came because we have such a great big white middle class on it. Anyway, the main goal of uh, CCB was to address that wealth gap through increasing home ownership on it. So this uh, subject matter today fits perfectly. It could almost be called the goal of, uh, of CCB. So we came to this, we wanted to say, how do we go about addressing this thing, this wealth gap on it and increase home ownership? And we came to three steps on it. We said, first, we have to uncover the steps or the racist policies that are inhibiting home ownership in, in California today. On Second, we had to see what we could do to eliminate and address those uh, racist policies that were inhibiting home ownership. And third, try to promote new legislation and new policies that promote home ownership for all on it. Our first step we revealed, by the way, most of the stuff that we had found created quite a bit of turmoil in the community on it, especially our uh, addressing the policies of the uh, climate change on it. One of the things we found was part of the cli climate change was affect disproportionately affecting communities of color on it. One of the first uh, uh, and major inhibitors to home ownership in California was the misuse of CEQA and the loopholes in CEQA. The two loopholes were one that anybody could file a lawsuit and to stop a housing uh, development anonymously. So the plaintiff would never know who's suing you. It's probably one of the few times that you can't find out who's suing you. It's almost like putting a KK Okay, hood over a person when you don't know who's behind behind it. The other thing is in the sequel is you can file lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. We found places where uh, home uh, developments were sued eight times on it, where the developer finally gave up and says, "I can't keep doing this." The cost the cost of all these lawsuits was increasing so much that it made it impossible for a developer to to do that on it. That was one. The other uh, um, inhibitor has been the failure to uh, of the housing element law. It has not been followed by local uh, governments. Local governments uh, are required every other year to provide a plan to meet the housing needs of their community. But there, there is no teeth to enforce that. So they do the plan, send it into Sacramento, and it's so good. And then they uh, avoid doing that on it. The other thing, the other thing we found was a high cost of liability insurance for building condos. We did a cursory review of uh, nonprofit developers and asking why are, are of your building ninety to ninety five percent of the building you're building rentals? We need rentals on it but why aren't you building any homes for sale and the one issue that came up was the high cost of cons construction uh, defect liability for condos much different than it is for renters easier for renters to do on it the other uh, major thing we found was the restrictive fees that raise the cost for granny uh, housing units uh, called ADUs now on it that was inhibiting so many people from being able to build and add uh, housing next to their home on it uh, for anyone. That didn't just didn't make any sense on it. Anyway, those were the major inhibiting factors on it. So what we have done to try to address them and to change them and, and, and get rid of them is we filed lawsuits um, against CARB, California Air Resources Board, for discrimination against minorities because they were raising the cost of, that minorities and others that were uh, the high cost of building homes of forty to four hundred thousand dollars more for each home on it. It didn't make sense on it, and it was falling disproportionately on new home buyers on it. 
Second thing we did was we filed lawsuits to close, we filed legislation to close the uh, sequel loopholes that, that I mentioned. We lost, we filed three of them and we lost all three of them on it. We also uh, tried to educate our community on these factors that were inhibiting uh, uh, the, the building of housing and home ownership on it. So what we did was we had conferences all across the state and we asked community leaders to join us in this fight. And we uh, actually have now 1,032 people working with us on uh, doing that. Second part of what we are doing is we're trying to educate college students. This is a really important issue because the lack of home ownership is not only affecting today uh, uh, communities of color, but it is affecting millennials and college students tremendously. This is a population, by the way, that's going to carry the burden of supporting seniors like me, but we're not investing in their ability to be able to, to pay for the growing uh, uh, senior population on it because we, they are not getting the same ability to uh, buy a home and build the wealth that will that'll help them uh, um, cover the burden on it. Their ability to get a home is nil compared to the parents uh, on it. So this, uh, this uh, home ownership uh, is, uh, the lack of home ownership is affecting so many more people on it. I'll end there and then leave us some time for questions and answers. Great, thank you so much, John. So we're next gonna move into the, the um, discussion and Q&A portion of this. So I just wanna give a few sort of ground rules and housekeeping. Um, so since we have so many people on the line, uh, we're gonna have to take the questions through the chat. So feel free to write your questions there. Uh, and if you want to submit a question anonymously, you can send it directly to me. You'll see an option there to either send to everyone or send to a specific person. Look for Mitch Mankin and then if you don't want your name to be uh, shared out, that's how you can do that. And just a reminder to let's keep the discussion respectful. Let's avoid fragility. What, when we're hearing someone else's narrative, sometimes people can get antsy wanting to hear their own story, but let's be patient because we're all here to learn and expand our perspectives from hearing from our speakers today who are experts and well-versed in the uh, fields of racial equity and homeownership. All right, so um, feel free to start putting questions in the chat box. We'll have two of us who are sorting through the questions, then we'll ask questions of our speakers. All right, first off we have from Lucas Ramirez, what concrete actions can local governments take to dismantle systemic racism? Uh, particularly related to land use and housing. Local, I can address that a little bit. Local governments can build homes that require them to build the homes. Sorry, John, we lost you for there. Okay, did you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I think one of the things local governments can do is to com comply with the housing element laws that requires them to build housing for all the population in their, in their areas. Any responses, Kevin or Dejan? Dejan? Yeah, so, so, so let's, let, let's, let's break it down to a very local level, right? Because I think sometimes I was always told very early on to, you know, think globally, but move locally. Um, our city council um, are voted in members who represent, and in theory, represent community. When you take one particular district and you understand the power we have in community to impact and impact change, let's just take one scenario. You work with your local district councilor in the sense of trying to understand where do my tax money go? I own property in the city of Oakland. I understand that that tax money is collected by the treasurer. Well, that treasurer is, may not be particularly focused just on the challenges of Oakland, but they're representing the whole county. That's billions of dollars that they are taking in every single year, right? Not just residential, but they're taking in commercial property taxes. What, what banks does that money sit in? One thing we can do, and that we're doing in Oakland, and we're challenging our treasurer, who has already implemented these, these strategies, is to have that capital sit in local community banks. Why? 
What have we discovered even in the recent PPP loan debacle? Wells Fargo came out very early on saying all the money had already been given up. And what was discovered, they had given up to some of their most choice clients, which are usually the clients who probably don't need the loans. Well, community banks should be more supported than you're seeing these Chase, Wells Fargo, uh, B of A banks, right? If I take a community locally, a locally chartered bank that has a direct mission to increase in prosperity in their local community, our treasury dollars, which the community is putting in, through via property taxes should sit in these community banks. Because why? These community banks have the ability to lend and loan out to local community members. If that funds, we know treasury funds cannot be directly lended back to community. It's just, it, it's not, it's, it's through the charter, they're not allowed to create a program that allows those funds to be given back out to community. But what they can do is where those funds sit, a bank traditionally takes those deposits and then lends out. But if we hold our treasurer, we hold our city council to say those funds should sit in a community bank and a community bank should have a charter to how they're supporting small businesses locally and how they're supporting home ownership locally. That is one quick way that we can bring action or change these systemic issues. Because we know ultimately it's not algorithms or computer programs that are making decisions. There are people that are making those decisions. Yeah, I just want to quickly add to that. Uh, something that I feel is if both my co-panelists, John and Boy and Kevin Coleman have brought up so far, uh, something that's very fundamental to this question of, of how do we address uh, the systemic issues that we have here. And I'm happy, Kevin, you brought in the charter because uh, just as individuals, right, whenever we have to rid ourselves of the conditioning that, of condition of impl implicit biases and so forth, right, um, we have to unlearn things. And I'm happy you brought up the charter because we do have to take a look back at the the uh, policies that were pre-existing today's mind of equality, today's perception of, of actualizing uh, equity. And something that is fundamental to that is uh, a term that we use at Greenline and call cultural competency. Um, I, I do have a definition for you that I will put in the chat momentarily, but essentially it's the integration and transformation of knowledge about individuals and groups of people into specific standards, policies, practices, and attitudes used in appropriate cultural settings to increase the quality of services, thereby producing better outcomes. So this is something that's essential when we're talking about equity here, because again, we, we saw the Monopoly board game. We saw that you know one community in particular was able to lap 246 times. This is something we have to take into consideration, this deficit from the perspective of other communities that we have to take into consideration when we are producing solutions, right? And this is something that Greenline in, embeds in our racial equity framework. Again, a way to ensure that we are including the voices that have been historically marginalized or excluded from the table, right? We gotta include these voices throughout the entire process so that equity is embedded in it. That's how we operationalize, right, um, um, equity. That's exactly how we do that. Now, I'm going to just stop there, but I'm going to put that definition in the chat for you all. Great. Thank you, Dejan. We have another question here. How do we hold electeds accountable? It seems like they say yes during election season, but no during budget season. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, oh, boy. Let John, let John go. Um, I don't know. We I don't know if there's a real answer. We've been trying for uh, so long to so long to do that. In fact, I don't know if it's all the time of holding our legislators accountable as because they're always changing and always looking to go up to the to uh, their next election uh, on it or you well the next step up on it. But I would like to uh, address a little bit. Then I see a question there about eliminating eliminating the mortgage discussion, Mitch. There was a question about that. Yeah, on it. I, to answer that person very quickly, they ought to take a look at David Chu's bill that would eliminate the mortgage deduction for people's second home on that. And if he's in, if they're interested, we've also had Hannah, uh, one of our uh, people in our office, has written an excellent study on how um, we are today. The government is subsidizing 
homeowners already rather than and richer homeowners rather than helping people get into homes lower in, in income people it's an excellent study she did and if they're interested they uh, write to our, let our office know and we'll send them a copy yeah, and i, I want to you know I, I think in terms of uh, what john stated is that what we're seeing across this nation um and particularly a lot of dismantling that is happening in real time right i think Ultimately, we, we put the power and the onus outside of ourselves, but the reality is we have to see ourselves that we are empowered in the process. And partly being empowered in the process is understanding our power in it. And so what we have done, um, we have bought assets in what they consider traditionally distressed communities. One of the first thing is, I, I don't see it as, I see it differently. When I come in, I see you know your uh, roofer who migrated to this country and worked his butt off to buy his home and start his business. I see maintenance men who support and make sure that our properties are upkeep, right? For, for, for me, those are the, the empowerment part of our community. Um, I don't see our elected official as any more powerful than the people who live in the community. And partly that requires us, um, and, and, and this pandemic I think has created the perfect storm because all the distractions that normally um, keeps us from actually focusing on the solution or being part of the solution have been removed. So we have to we have to first be present, right? I don't believe the, the onus is just on city council. I believe the onus is on us as a community, right? So we look at coalition building, partly it begins with educating, right? And so, you know, when we come together, for example, in the Sabrina Park community, we bought a property. And one of the things that we did, we started implementing our own solution. And one of it was, how can we create subsidy that then gets sold or invested back into the kid who live in the property. And some of the responsibility we put on the family is that they re they're required to go to a board meeting once a month, right? They're required to not only go to the meeting, whether it's one parent or both the parent, but one of the parents is required to go and be part of the process, right? And then there's community associations that are, have been in existence for, 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 for decades. I think what people um, outside community do not recognize is community has been fighting for these changes forever in the day. I just think that we have not highlighted or we have not supported community in these efforts. So I think where we have uh, uh, you know, a great opportunity now in this time period is that there's a great awakening first that's happening, right? You, you know, if you don't value a community, you don't really have, you're not gonna see the need to actually support that community. And I think for a lot of period of time, when nonprofit developers come in, they're checking the box because all they see these communities as low income communities. And I see these communities as prosperous, people who want desire the same things for their children as in the communities I live in, right? Where there's healthy schools and there's healthy aspirations for the children. I don't see a lack in that in the, in the properties that we're developing and the properties we own. They want the same things. So first, it starts with us in a position where we have influence. And if that influence is where we have the, we have the, you know, we work in the banking community. It's us challenging how we lend, how we educate. It's us challenging even the space in, that we work in, right? Because ultimately everyone has a role in this process, right? And I always, always say this to be the case, and this is what we've experienced. Particularly in communities, marginalized community, you will see forever in a day, hey, you know, that school is the, the Martin Luther King School or the Rosa Park School. But where you start to see resistance is what Dijon was bringing in is, when we actually request to participate in the wealth creation of, in the building of the school, that's where it becomes one of a, whoa, 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 slow down. We have no problem naming the school after your freedom fighters, but when the conversation becomes to wealth creation and how we actually build wealth, that is where the, that is where the brakes get put. So we have to first look at this challenge as a continuation of our civil rights and move it into a wealth rights, an economic rights. We have, all of us collectively, all marginalized communities have participated in the system by the paying of taxes. So we should also participate in the wealth creation that is occurring. So I think for us, it's about understanding where our power is locally. And that is our district. That is the people who are representing our community. And then starting to be intentional about who and where these contracts are going and starting to hold them accountable that if there are small, uh, you know, small uh, contractors that are starting their businesses, how do we support those contractors? They may not have the ability to sign off 
on, on debt, or they may not have the ability to sign on completion guarantees, which is a key uh, way in which marginalized communities are, are kind of kept out of where wealth is created and developed in our communities. We have to figure out, well, how can we check that box for them, or how can we partner them with these companies that are coming in to build in our community? That is the way in which locally we can start to change the tides. It's an economic fight. It's a wealth creation fight. Ultimately, that is what it's boiling down to. Yes, and just to briefly add to that, um, something that I think that Green Line uh, would love to encourage on a consistent basis is for you all to push your elected officials, right, to, to think uh, in ways in which, you know, we could, we could uh, address these systemic issues, right? Now, something that Kevin mentioned, right, we got to inform one another, right, inform people, organize and mobilize to every capacity that you can so that folks have the relevant information to best advocate on behalf of themselves and the community. That is very important. Um, I also heard notions of the relationship, having a relationship with the existing entities in your community, whether it's local officials, whether uh, you know uh, which, which organizations or companies are serving your community members. Right. Things that we think through, at Green, and just to streamline, I know Mitch, you put a question in there about how Greenlining, uh, Greenlining's initiative to empower renters to build wealth, equity, rent payments, and building their credit. Um, things that we think through, right, that we are constantly raising towards local officials, policymakers, and so forth, and banks in, included, because a lot of our work is around yeah. uh, financial accountability. Um, we like to ask, uh, how are banks investing our com into our community? Right. How many affordable home loans are banks making into giving communities of color? Right. How are they participating in community reinvestment? Or are they giving money to nonprofits led by POC? Right. These are all questions that not only should we be asking them, but also asking ourselves and having this discussion amongst one another. Right. So we can all stay informed and equipped. Other questions that are definitely worth asking is how do we determine someone's eligibility to repay other than credit? Right. We understand that the, the barrier that credit has been for several communities. Um, how do we create and increase access to a robust down payment assistance program? How can we provide for system, system impacted folks, right? Uh, someone also mentioned in the chat uh, zoning, the restrictions that have occurred as a result of zoning and lack of reinvestment. How can we ensure access to high quality neighborhoods that were are artificially excluding the black community and uh, the, the brown community, other communities of color, right? Through the use of zone restrictions. How can we improve access to our loan products uh, for these communities, for the most vulnerable communities, for the under the bank, for the unbanked, right? How, how can we make sure that these folks are being trapped into predatory terms? So these are all tough questions that we need to regularly ask and keep in the faces of our policymakers and our elected officials, all of our representatives, to make sure that our interest is the one that is being accounted for at the end of the day. Because someone is definitely meeting with them and their mm -hmm. voices are heard. But the, the question is, why aren't our voices being heard? Mm -hmm. Rich, you know, let me, yeah, let me throw out a crazy idea that kind of that we've been thinking about that addresses a lot of the questions of uh, getting more um, funds for home building, addressing the zoning issues and all of those uh, We've been playing with a crazy idea. We call it a, a, the unholy alliance of putting together uh, all of the fact, community factors and business factors who make a profit from uh, building homes on it. And so what we're attempting to do is put together community leaders, banks, developers, uh, uh, realtors, uh, unions, and um, people who su suppliers of the of what's needed to build homes and others, whoever makes a little bit of profit from each home that is built on it. If we all work together and, and took a little bit discount from each, let's say for instance, the realtor says, for these homes we're building out of this, this plot of money on that is brought up, I will take, the realtor says, I will take five and a half percent interest on each home I sell instead of the normal six percent. If the bank says I will take a half percent interest less on the money I provide to the developer to build the homes and the uh, person who buys a home, they take a little less. If the person developing or the company developing the supplies says I'll take 10 percent less 
in supplies I provide for all of these homes. If everybody put skin in the game into an alliance together, we can lower the cost of housing substantially so more people can, can afford to buy it and we can build more. This is a win-win-win for everyone. It, it's a really unholy alliance because most of these people are competitors at different times on it. But by working together and developing it just for the sum of funds that are due, that put together for these homes, I think we can make a big difference on that. But it'll take everybody uh, that doesn't work together to come together and be able to do that. Because supply is the problem. It, 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 the supply. Go ahead. And I think it goes back to will, right? I think, you know, particularly Silicon Valley is the innovation of capital of the world. But yet and still, we are dealing with an inequality that does not take a, a, a PhD to solve, right? It just takes the will, as John laid out, uh, that see that collectively, we all rise as a nation. Right. Um, and if we have a heart to seek equitable outcomes, and we don't see the game as a zero-sum game where basically in order for me to win, you must lose. I think we have to start thinking communal. And I believe as a nation, we're moving there. We look at our economy, the Uber, the Airbnb. It's a shift to saying, how do what I own can benefit my larger community, right? And I think we're moving from the zero sum game that has, I think, guided a lot of the decision making. Because you got to remember, the same intentionality it takes to think of return on investing, if we put that same intentionality to say, how does my investment impact community? And I'm, I'm just as intentional. We can think through quickly how to improve communities all across this nation. So it goes back to will, right? And this is a part where we can't legislate the heart, but I believe everyone that has joined in this call, it doesn't take a whole army to change a nation. Mm -hmm. You know, we have seen historically how we mythalize these people, but we always have to remember these men and women were simply human. And they were simply, they had the same things working inside them as in us. And so it just takes having the will and doing what we can. And so to John's point, we have to also look at who has a seat at the table. Uh, I'm, not take, I'm not talking about private land because private land can be done whatever privately needs to be done. But most of our development is being done on public owned land. And most of our developments in our community requires community participation in order to change variants. So it requires community to voice opinion or opposition. And a lot of times when developers come in, they understand they're coming into communities that have been dealing with epidemics and pandemics one generation after the other. So a lot of times they're coming into communities in survival mode, working three and four jobs just to keep a roof over the head. To be realistic, to add in another layer, to be able to go to a commissioner's meeting, listening to a developer talk about development, it's hard to understand how that impacts their life until it impacts their life. And that's the problem too, is that we're in a survival mode. And it's almost like as long as we're kept in a survival mode, the will is not created in order to actually show up in these spaces. So we have to, we have to amongst our own community, figure out how can we get out survival mode to understand that we have to be present in these spaces. Because if we're not in these spaces, what ends up happening the developers come in, they find community uh, nonprofits run by uh, people of color. They give them maybe, you know, $10,000 and tell them to put on a t-shirt and take a photo out. They look at, I'm part of community. But the reality is they're doing a billion dollar development in their community that in the next five years, their community would no longer be their community. So I think that is where we have to start at is that we have to first show up in these spaces, you know, but also understand that who has a seat in the decision making need to represent community. These nonprofits that are coming up saying they're solving this inequality, look at their board. My thing is this, if, if our communities not only survived, but thrived through epidemics, pandemics for generations, why are they not at the seat at the table thinking through solutions? That to me is interesting that the problem is created and then the people who create problems now saying they have a solution, I think we have to look at this holistically. And that's, that, is, that is why we do the work we do. It is a holistic approach. It takes like-minded individuals, like on this call, it takes a collective of all of us 
who truly have a heart for equitable outcomes, who truly believe in the nation's ideals. When you look up the, you look up 1866, it called out very early on that this is a nation of equality. And at the end of the day, that is a spirit. If you have a spirit of equality, you need to have a seat at the table. That's not a color. That's a spirit, period. That's not man. That's not woman. That's not black. That's not white. That's not Latino. That's not Asian. That is a spirit. And that's a human spirit that knows no bound. That's not an American spirit because that spirit can be found in South America. That spirit can be found in Africa. That spirit can be found in Europe. That spirit can be found in in Asia Pacific. It is purely a spirit. And my thing is this, if you do not have a heart for equitable outcomes, you should not be making decisions that impact community, period, period. Thank you, Kevin, powerful words. Uh, so we're, all, we're about at time here, we're a couple minutes over actually. Um, but since we have so much to discuss, if people are able to stick around on the line and um, talk a little longer, we'll do that, we'll go for a few minutes more. Uh, but since I know some folks have to sign off, I'm just going to do the, uh, the closing uh, um, stuff right now. Uh, first off, I just wanted to give a giant thank you to our panelists. Uh, absolutely amazing presentations. We're very lucky to have you here with us today, sharing what you've just shared today. Um, we will have a recording available of this event, so that people will be able to come back and like revisit. And for those who weren't able to make it into the call, since we had this 100 living on our Zoom account, um, you will have a way to access that. So just look out for an email from SV at home. We're gonna send out uh, that along with the, the slides, I believe, and then the, uh, a couple of videos from the 200 that explain sort of some uh, historical context that was gone through here. Uh, so look out for that email. Uh, a little bit about Silicon Valley at home. You can learn more about our organization and what we do about affordable housing work on our website. Uh, you can also find out how to become a member. We are a member supported organization, uh, so we're doing it you know, all together as a big tent of folks who are coming together for affordable housing. Um, and finally, so the Housing Action Coalitions are meant to be focusing towards action. And there's often so much to understand and so much to learn that it's hard to get to that point. But we always, uh, we always do our best to come to some ideas that become actions. And I think you've heard some ideas from our panelists today that each one of you can take with yourselves and uh, um, begin to put into practice in your own lives and in your advocacy. advocacy. Uh, we're working with many community partners in many important areas. We're, we do some work on dismantling exclusionary zoning in San Jose, uh, and making sure housing opportunities are available for people of all incomes uh, in wealthy communities as well as in uh, less wealthy communities. And if you sign up for our newsletter, there will be future opportunities to engage with us. We often send out action alerts when there's something that's coming up at a city council meeting or at some sort of local planning commission uh, when something's going on around affordable housing in the area and there's an opportunity to engage, we'll, we got your back, we'll let you know, because uh, that's what we're here to do. Uh, so with that, let's go on to our next question. Um, this is a question we got a little bit ago, let me pull it up again. We got a question about a suggestion from the book, The Color of Law. There was suggest a suggestion to deny the mortgage introduction to property owners in suburbs that don't enforce inclusionary development. Do you think that that's a uh, fruitful solution? Yeah. Uh, very forceful. I, uh, I don't know how it, we'd ever be able to get that, <laughs> to get that uh, legislation done, but it's a wonderful solution. Okay. We have another question here that's, um, what strategies are there to address neighborhood NIMBY voices when new developments are planned and needed? Well, I think one of the first steps anybody in that community who is being affected by NIMBYs would be to contact the NIMBY organizations, the Yes in My Backyard. They've done a great job at advocating for and addressing uh, the NIMBYs work on it. That would be one of the first steps I think that could, could be taken. The second step would be to take a look at the um, plan that the government that the local government had to uh, introduce to the state on their housing and in turn can file a countersuit saying for the failure of, of uh, complying with the home element law on it would be one one way to do it i right now off the top of my head i can't think of another so I, i'm sorry my, my, my phone was on mute regarding the color of law regarding the color of law okay. question 
Um, I've got a question about how to stay connected with the speakers. I want to ask if you guys are able to share your content information if you're comfortable in the chat. People can maybe uh, follow up afterwards if they have to leave or something. So just just want to put that in there and then uh, I'll let you continue going. Yeah, I'll put my contact information in, but I'm sorry, I was on mute regarding the color law. The color law book, when I read it, um, what's interesting, and I don't want to spoil it, but it begins here in the Bay Area. And I don't know, you know, I've lived a long life. I've read a lot of books. To me, it was the most powerful, succinct um, analysis of historical documents. Um, and to me, the most um, <laughs> strongest argument on how federal, state, and local governments gave rise to the segregations in our community. Um, it, it's powerful. So I just, I just recommend, if you have not had a chance to read Richard's book, The Cover Law, it's phenomenal. And it starts in our backyard. I mean, it starts literally in my grandparents' generation. Uh, my grandparents came from the South, moved to Oakland. Um, they lived on, in the projects until, until those laws were changed where they were able to kind of move freely afterward. Um, so it hit home, but I think it hits home for all of us because ultimately, whether um, we were complicit or implicit, the reality of it is, you know, you know, because of the lack of knowledge, you know, we perish, right? Division is created. Uh, uh, and I think we have more in common than we have in differences, right? So I think the color law, what it does is it allows for us to do a, a historical analysis. So, so that suggestion he had in the book, um, we have to tie back to these were state, state sanctioned economic warfare. So if it was a state-sanctioned state economic warfare, the state has a role in how they are restoring these injustices. And I think a lot of times we see it historically like that happened, you know, 500 years ago. No one was in their lifetime. Well, I can, I can touch my grandmother. You know, my grandmother lived through it. Um, my grandmother can touch people. Her parents were, 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 got the experience in the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so I never saw it as this, you know, far off thing. I was always able to understand I can touch history. I can call up history every single day. Though she's up in her 90s now, um, you know. So I, I first start by saying, you know, that's, that's, that, that strategy he implemented, we have to think at that level, right? You know, when I've talked about where our property tax dollars sit, what banks they sit in, and how we hold these banks accountable, because I'm not asking private people to do things with their own personal money. I'm saying the money that we put into the system, how does that money then uh, support and restore and grow and prosper all communities? So we have to start at the local level. We have to start connecting the dots. We have to look at how land is being distributed, public owned land, because if I'm paying taxes, I have a part of ownership in that public land. And I always believe that for a lot of our development, and there's been a lot of great gains being made, right? But I think for a lot of it, we check the most minimum box. We check whatever the minimum requirement is, that is the box we check. And I believe that we have the power to really reimagine and innovate, just like we're innovating this communication tools that we're using right now, right? We're now able to see each other. We're now able to hold Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. If we take that same innovation to the development space, we would see the same advancement. And I think Scott Wiener is doing a hell of a job at the state level addressing these not in my backyard uh, uh, resistance to growth and development. I think it's disingenuous. I understand there has to be, um, uh, uh, there has to be thoughtfulness to how we're developing, but I think the generation that grew their wealth, that had the ability to buy properties, that had the ability to buy you know, affordable homes and grow their wealth over the life of their kids and grandkids, I think they should be the first one in line to continue that legacy to the next generation. And what is being done at a state level is commendable. SB 35, just uh, SB 35, SB 38, there's so many new state legislation that is now trumping local and community opposition to development. And I think it's well overdue. So we just have to, A, support these state legislators that are doing really political suicide in a sense because NIMPY is well-funded. These development, anti-development groups are well-funded. They back politicians who support their cause, even if them politicians do not agree. So we need to organize and support those who are advocating and fighting our behalf. And I think that is what is happening real time. And I commend, we make a lot of jokes about the millennial generation and the generational Z. 
but they are shaking this earth up. And at all the grief we give them that every generation does or the generation that precedes them, I commend them for what they are highlighting and they are not letting up that we as a nation will be held to our ideals of equality for all. Starting with- This is John Gamboa. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to drop off. I have another meeting on it, but I would recommend the author, by the way, of The Color of Law shares our offices in, in Berkeley. He's a wonderful guy. He's building, a, he's writing a second book on it, but I would recommend to everybody to take a look at Michael Schellenberger's book. It's soon going to be released. It gives a really good input, different input on housing and the uh, inhibiting factors on housing. Michael Schellenberger, by the way, is a uh, one of the leaders of our council on it. But I want to thank you, Mitch, and everybody at SCV for putting this on. It was, was great on it. So with that, I will be dropping off. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple more questions here if people are game to continue talking. Um, well, let me scroll back up to it here. Uh, here's a question. How do we get additional funding sources available for affordable home ownership in particular? This is not the focus of many funding sources locally at the state level. That is something that uh, we prioritize at Greenlining as a part of our work with financial accountability. So essentially what that means is we meet with different financial institutions um, to leverage the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, again, that was a bill that was passed uh, in response to redlining, in direct response to redlining. It, um, I'm not sure what everyone's level of familiarity is with the CRA, but it essentially created a metric for us to grade how well served our communities are from financial institution products. Um, so again, uh, something that we do within these meetings is question, how can we work around systemic barriers? How can we advocate for development and support of initiative and affordable home ownership models, including shared equity strategies and land trust? How can we provide um, housing counseling, right? Creating or supporting and expanding the access to housing counselors who can ensure that homeowners and potential home uh, and potential homeowners are armed with the knowledge they need uh, to make weight decisions, right? How can we create access to fair credit, working around the um, dynamics of it that has uh, created the barrier, the systemic barriers that it, it had? Um, how can we create a strategy that puts the needs of family, families and first time buyers seeking affordable homes ahead of investors and speculators? How can we create robust down payment assistance, right? How can we encourage for more transparency and accountability? And again, it, for us, in terms of organize, we have organized with different, we're a grassroots organization. We organize with different uh, grassroots community members, um, grassroots organizations and community members to ensure that, you know, the strength in numbers are felt, right? Felt in these spaces. So again, uh, would definitely encourage more organization. So to organize, mobilize folks and to put pressure on these banks. Right to put pressure on financial institutions, put pressure on on elected officials to address these uh, questions. Kevin, well, I know at the state level, um, because prior to the pandemic, you know, we were dealing with a housing crisis, and at the state level, uh, the governor had put uh, billions of dollars that will be funneling and trickling into our local community. Um, you know, I think that's where the, the funding source will be moving forward. I think the challenge that we had historically was that the market was so red hot, there was not an incentive to do workforce housing, um, which we focus in on more than affordable. We focus in more on workforce housing, um, which is basically housing for teachers, your counselors, uh, your managers at Target. Um, I think liquidity in the market is coming. Um, but to Dijon's point is it's us, it's us, us connecting the dots, you know, you know, how, uh, as a community, um, we stand behind equitable developers um, who are looking at not just affordable housing, but looking at the ability to afford the house, right? And I think that's a that's a key piece in the, that's missing in the conversation. Um, you know, the the affordable aspect is very key, and it has has kind of dominate most of the conversations. But I don't think 
we spend enough time on our ability to afford our homes, which is an equity conversation. So yes, from a, from a capital perspective, state is enacting a lot of uh, liquidity into the marketplace. Um, you have the big announcements by Google, Facebook, but I think, you know, if you work at a company like Facebook who is making um, these grand uh, pronouncement, announcements regarding, you know, their commitment to, um, you know, solving the housing crisis that they understand that they participated in, in the sense of um, their, their position in these communities and their impact to the community. So they're trying to address it by providing capital to start to build these homes. But I think the challenge when you start to peel the layers back um, is that traditionally that capital is flowing to a very limited amount of practitioners, right? And I think there are the, the need to talk about checking the affordable housing box, but there's also the need of checking the, how is that capital growing the wealth in community? Because if we start to address that point, then all the other points will be addressed. So I think we start with, if you work in tech and you work at Google and Google's made the big announcement that they're putting up, I think they're trying to build 2000 homes, finding out in your company, who is making these decisions and how do you start to galvanize our resource groups in those companies? You know, there are all, there are a multitude of, uh, you know, uh, multinational resource groups. There are specific resource groups to support marginalized employees. I think it's a coalition even amongst those companies to start to hold the capital accountable to say, Hey, okay, who is actually, where's that capital being held at? Because if that capital is held in the community bank, I go back there again, community banks, had a specific charter to supporting community members. So if we start to connect those dots, then we will start to see as a community member, I'm not gonna go to a Wells Fargo bank. I'm going to go to a beneficial bank. I'm gonna go to a credit union that is focusing on the advancement and upliftment of their local community. But we have a role if we work at Google to challenge them to say that capital is gonna be held somewhere. That capital is gonna be used by a developer what does that developer's board look like? What does the developer mix look like? Is it representative of the community in which they're building in? Because if, it's not, if it doesn't represent the community in which they're building in, there will always be a disconnect, right? There will always be a disconnect regarding our access to the capital and our access to quality housing. So we have to start making those two connections between where the capital is flowing and who it's flowing to. Mm -hmm. And, and to that point, I want to tie in as well, the role in which uh, the tech companies could play right, moving forward. You have to take into consideration the, ex the exponential growth within fintech services and products in this day and age. And I know currently the CRA is uh, being amended and weakened, but we need to find a way to strengthen the CRA to where these fintech providers are included. Uh, I don't know, in California, I believe five of the top 10 home lenders are uh, online lenders. Right? Because they don't have a brick and mortar, they aren't subjected to the same um, jurisdictions or compliances as a bank. So the CRA has no jurisdiction over them whatsoever. But we need to be, find a way to bring these players to the table because there, there's a whole host of money that, that would easily fund a lot of the initiatives that we need within our community. So I just want to also highlight that. Great. I think let's do one more question and we'll have some closing statements and we'll wrap up just in the interest of time. Uh, so there's a question here from Ray about how do we balance new construction with the impacts it can have on trading gentrification? Repeat mm -hmm. that. the question, Mitch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, how do we balance new construction with the impacts it can have uh, on creating gentrification? And I, it doesn't specify, but you might, you know, talk about housing and new construction versus mm -hmm office new construction. Yes. Probably different facts there. Yeah. Great, great question. Um, so let's just take a step back. I don't think we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and when we look at the build environment and its impact environmentally, we were able to create a certification that um, the build community was held accountable in the sense of how they were addressing environmentally the impact. Right. A whole certification was created. A whole green building council was created and it was created to look at how we're designing, how we're constructing and how we're operating and building 
uh, in our communities, right? And the whole goal was that we want to sustain uh, the health of our communities, right? By looking at what type of products we're using, by looking at the build process in which we're implementing. So I don't think, you know, it takes a great deal of work to reimagine how we can implement that same thought process when it comes to human life. Um, I am all for the preservation of our environment. I have two young boys. And when I see them, I see my great, great, great grandchildren. So there's a need environmentally to protect it. But I think, you know, more emphasis should be put on the protection of human life. And we look at our communities, the health disparities because of our build and because of what we've allowed to occur in marginalized communities, particularly when it comes to, you know, toxic waste, um, when it comes to, you know, how we protect these communities from environmental um, injustices. I think that same intentionality that, that the Green Bill Council um, implemented uh, should be implemented when it comes to equitable outcomes for our community. Now, how do we do that? Well, when the Green Building Council was looking at the holistic built environment, they took every single level and ensured that there was a, a, a vision or there was a reimagining in how we did things, how we conduct business. If we look at the first step in the process in building in our community, right? That first step is the developers and architects that are coming in. If there is not at that level a value of the life that lives in the community, the outcome and the output will be in direct conflict to that community. So we have to first hold accountable the architects and the developers. In the same way, the developer and architect communities held accountable in their impact environmentally to our community. The second layer from a construction perspective is that for a lot of it, it's the box that are being checked. Unfortunately for a lot of, uh, you know, small business contractors in the communities in which development is occurring are not able to check these boxes. But when we have an equity mindset on and we're intentionally looking at how do we create equitable Certifi certi certification for development, we start to say, hey, you know, uh, you know, large scale con you know, constructing company, I'm not going to throw any names out for the sake of, you know, uh, <laughs> for the sake of just keeping us focused on, on solutions. But, you know, when you take these large construction companies that take on most of these projects in these communities, and you start to ask them, how are you creating equitable outcomes for the community which you're building in? You're, gr you're growing your wealth in these communities but you have, you're not thinking intentional about what are the small contracting companies that you can partner alongside. And you know, from an equitable perspective, from a healthy perspective, allow them to participate in the process. It may not take on the full project, but they can walk alongside that, that, that contractor, that, that construction uh, company, right? The next layer up underneath that is, once a building is stabilized, there's a lot of ways in which that building is supported. If it's a large scale apartment complex, it's being supported through landscaping, it's being supported through maintenance, it's being supported through property management. And when you talk about a marginalized community, right, that, um, that we have identified wealth is the greatest way in which a community is able to raise itself out of uh, poverty, well then there's still wealth creation that's being uh, created post construction even in the management and support of that building. But when we have a intentionality that is also um, shown in the green building industry, if we have that same intentionality in our human industry and think equitably from the, the formation or the design, then we're gonna design a more equitable outcome for our community. That work cannot be done post-engagement. That work cannot be done once the building is completed. It starts the very first day that that building is designed. I always remind people that if we got to these situations because someone designed it, well then that's powerful because that means someone can come and redesign it in a more equitable way. And we've already seen it in the lead, you know, green building council environment. We can take cues from there. And that is what we're working on. It's creating equitable outcomes all in every single stack in the development process.
Great, Dijon, did you have something to speak on that before we go to the uh, closing, just closing remarks and action? All right, so I guess I just wanna give you, Kevin and Dijon, just the opportunity to, if you have a closing thought or if you have uh, a way people can stay plugged in after this meeting, uh, to share that now. You said for 10 left, Kevin, you are muted. Ah, yes. So I'll put in the chat, uh, but I can be reached at uh, kevin.coleman at kingdom61.com. Um, I'll put in the chat so it'll be there. And also when Mitch sends a presentation out, um, you know, you'll have my email contact information. Um, I look forward to uh, talking and connecting and building. I believe that um, it takes a community. One of our tagline is that it takes a village to raise a village. Um, I think this is not the responsibility upon one party. I think it collectively as all Americans, um, this is this is the work that we collectively have to do together. And I believe that um, we are the right people for that work. Um, we have innovated. Uh, we have uh, done some great things as a nation. And I think this is just our next step in that process. So for me, um, I look forward to, uh, like with John, I didn't know that the Color of Law author was right in the Bay Area. I literally would be reaching out to John trying to set up to go meet him because that book changed my life in the sense of uh, being able to really understand, you know, how things uh, were created. So um, I look forward to reaching out. Um, I thank you guys. I want to first say, let me just say this. Thank you to the Silicon Valley uh, Home uh, Initiative. Um, this foundation, uh, I want to first commend you guys. It's tough having tough conversations. Yes. Um, but I think once we move that to the side and realize ultimately um, we are all in this together, Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, um, like I tell a lot of counselors and commissioners, you might not have been alive or in the seat 50 mm -hmm. years ago when a lot of these policies were, were implemented. But we are now the elders that we were looking for as children. Mm -hmm. We are now the very people that we had hoped would come. It is now on us and is now our time. So I thank you for allowing us. Uh, and, and I thank everyone who took the time to join this conversation. Stay on. Um, and I look forward to uh, building with you. I look forward to hearing your story. I look forward to hearing um, what you are doing to solve it because I think no one has all the answers. We are all just um, believing it's a calling and just believing that we, we have something great to give back to our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll be brief. Much. Yeah, we have 30 seconds left. Dijon, do you have a last, last thing to say? I just also want to commend you all for holding this space, right? And thank you for everyone who, who attended and participated because it is, it is a difficult conversation that for years we have decided to uh, ignore or avoid, right? So the fact that we all understand moving forward that it takes all of us, right, to, to, work, to work through this and to bring forth the future and the reality that we want, it is it's life changing and we are making history right now. So I just commend you all for continuing to uplift uh, equality, right, and justice, righteousness, there you go. Oh, and uh, I look forward to connecting with everyone. My information will also be passed out um, yeah, in circulation of the slides. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much to both of you. Thanks to Dejan. Thanks to Kevin. Thanks for all of our participants for being with us today. Uh, you can check out Silicon Valley at Home on our website, siliconvalleyathome.org. You can check out um, Kingdom Development. You can check out uh, um, the Green Lining Institute. Uh, all in very important organizations to check out. Um, we're very happy to have you with us today, and uh, we're going to end the meeting now. Thank, Thank you. you.